Dr. Tom Bertrand, thank you for joining us on the Illinois Channel. You're welcome. Glad to join you. Nice to have you for the first time since you've took, taken over as the leadership of the Illinois Association of School Boards. And we wanted to touch base with you and kind of get an overview, if we might, on some of the issues that are on your radar screen. And uh, first of all, just to remind the viewers, you, I look at this organization as somewhat of a, a filter because you get input from people all around the state as sure. far as the board members and whether it's in an urban area or somewhere out in a small agricultural area. Sure. The school board members are all across the state and probably no one has a better feel on the pulse of what's going on in education than I think than the Association of School Boards. With that said, let's just start. What what are some of the major issues that you are focusing on at this time? Well, internally, as an association, we've got a strategic plan that our board of directors uh, approved in August, and uh, a lot of good work happening there, ranging from initiatives to promote stronger member engagement to a new website, uh, an Engage 21 outreach effort to our members, as we represent 846 school districts and nearly 6,000 school board members and 1.7 million students. So with that comes a lot of responsibility to work with boards to promote excellence in local school board governance and advocacy for public education. Externally, of course, our major focus right now is the spring legislative session, over 6,500 bills introduced and so that means a really busy time for our government relations staff as usually in a typical legislative season about half of those bills will in some way affect education and among those um, one of the bills that has come up of of late is to establish a minimum pay for teachers and because as we noted earlier that you have some school districts that are small rural communities. They don't have a lot of commercial property to tax, and uh, agricultural land is taxed at a lower rate than, or say, suburban areas. Uh, how would that bill, which eventually would, as I understand it, set a minimum teacher salary of forty thousand dollars by around right. 2023, if, right. if I remember? What is the position of the association on that and how would it impact your school board members or the district? Sure. Well, first, the, the positions of the Illinois Association of School Boards are actually established by our membership at a delegate assembly that takes place each November at our joint annual conference. And so from that come our position statements. And we actually have two position statements that um, are the reasons why the association has concerns about a minimum teacher salary and those position statements uh, are consistent with our local school boards having the authority as the representatives of the local communities and the taxpayers to determine wages and benefits for their employees and the second piece the, the association has a position about collective bargaining in that we would oppose legislation that diminishes the right and the responsibility of locally elected school boards to bargain with their employees. So the challenge with a minimum salary, we all want our teachers to be compensated fairly. We all want them to be paid as much as we can afford to pay them. The position of the association is that that's a decision that really needs to be determined locally, not mandated at the state level based upon the data we've seen and there are different sources of the data but the most conservative estimate by the state board of education has 400 districts impacted by the minimum salary in other words 400 districts that are below forty thousand dollars minimum salary currently we've seen other data that has that number over 500 school districts so it's it would have a substantial impact on school districts across the state Currently, there's nearly a $30,000 spread between the lowest paid starting teacher in our state and the highest paid starting teacher in our state. So it's a substantial spread. Uh, certainly $40,000 would close that to some degree, but still would be nearly a $20,000 spread. Well, and 
what would be the, the starting salary, the lowest approximate starting salary? Well, currently in the state, I, we've, we've seen numbers that there are 12 districts below $30,000 minimum starting salary, and the lowest is just under 27000 And then on the high end, you have some districts that are paying $57,000 to a starting teacher. So a substantial spread. So it would take a substantial increase in pay for those lowest districts to get to the $40,000 threshold. In fact, even though it's ramped over a five-year period to get to 40000 by our estimates, some of those districts would have to increase pay by 17 percent just to meet the year one threshold. So it's substantial. And if you're in a district that is in a high poverty area, a property poor area, that can be a real challenge uh, for a school district and for local school boards to, to have to meet. And uh, the other thing I would say is obviously the cost differential of living in some of these communities. You can just, I mean, the cost of rent is not like it is in Chicago or on the North Shore or something. So uh, $40,000 in one community is not $40,000 in another community, and the same with 27000 Sure. While no one would say that's a whole lot of money, it's on the other hand, uh, presumably enough to get people to come to work that they have teachers working in the district sure and uh, accepting it the other impact I didn't know speaking of minimum wages this is this bill that was recently signed into law by the governor setting fifteen dollars an hour as a minimum wage and on a full-time two thousand hour year uh, uh, you know work year that's a minimum salary of $30,000. Does that also, because that's not for teachers per se, does that have an impact on the school districts? Yes, and some might argue that would be even a greater impact on a school district than the minimum teacher salary. Um, because every part-time recess supervisor, bus monitor, uh, secretaries, cooks, custodians, maintenance staff, temporary seasonal workers, all of those positions going to $15 an hour could have a substantial impact. And both of these, again, we want to pay our staff as much as we possibly can afford to pay uh, because they deserve that. And it's important to recognize that. But the, our position is that the local school board is best positioned to make the decision of what the district and the taxpayers can afford to do. And so that's the challenge. And there's also a concern that we're naive if we believe that the rising tide will not lift all boats. The reality is if you increase the minimum wage for your hourly workers and then for your teachers, the rest of the staff are certainly going to expect you to do something with their compensation. Because if you increase a minimum wage to $15 per hour for a, a, a library aide or a bus monitor, well, then your staff who have been in the district for 10 years who may not be making much more than that are certainly going to expect to see an increase in their pay as well. Mm -hmm. What do we, what are those uh, poorer uh, school districts to do? How will they get by with these uh, mandated costs? Well, the bottom line is you'll have to pay them the mandated salaries and wages, and that normally means it comes at the expense of something else. And w one of the tenets of the evidence-based funding model to support greater funding to our public schools was that it was intended to support research-based elements that would produce positive outcomes for children, such as smaller class sizes in the lower elementary level, instructional coaches, uh, tutors, literacy coaches, professional development for teachers. And the reality is when a school district's budget is typically 70 to 80 percent salaries and benefits, and a bigger portion of, of that is going to be earmarked towards wages and benefits because of these new requirements, that's going to leave less to support some of these other practices that can positively impact our schools and our children. Again, I think it's all in the context of of local control and decisions that should be made locally about what's best for our school district and best for our school children. For those who don't know how government works behind the scenes, so to speak, uh, 
associate what is the, the purpose of many associations not just the school board association but almost every major industry like manufacturers have an association the teachers have their association etc um, you have lobbyists that then bring your message of your membership to the lawmakers is it correct right. yes when you meet with them when your lobbyists meet with them uh, if have they been meeting on these issues as yet and to what extent uh, can you say whether or not the lawmakers that you're talking to uh, get a are sympathetic to your arguments i think in most cases we find that lawmakers will at least have a conversation and will at least consider what we have to say um, there are times where we will respectfully disagree or vice versa and it is what it is at that point um, we have a responsibility to represent our members and that's what we will do but we usually try to work with a legislator if it's a curriculum mandate or some other mandate or proposal that they've got on the table that impacts schools we try to do our best to be a resource to them as well to educate them about how it actually affects the students the teachers the administrators and the, the taxpayers because sometimes Sometimes there are unintended consequences or outcomes of a bill that a legislator may not fully understand because they're passionate about the reasons why they advanced the bill in the first place. So normally we can work with legislators to, to have a conversation around how we might be able to help them, how we might be able to improve a bill, or the rationale for why we are opposing a bill. Yeah, I often say one of the laws we often see uh, come out of government is the law of unintended consequences. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, people, sometimes the lobbyists get a bad rap, but I would point out to them that lobbyists are often educators just on a particular issue. Yes. Uh, because no lawmaker, they might come from a background of education or medicine or maybe they were a garage mechanic. You can't know everything about everything. And we need lobbyists actually to fill us in on so many of these details so many of these issues are complex. One of the uh, bills that was passed recently, Senator Andy Menar of Central Illinois, and he, he comes from a small district, he, his hometown is Bunker Hill, uh, passed the new funding formula. And part of his argument was for those rural districts uh, to get them more money, in, we're early on in that process, or relatively early on. Uh, is there any lessons to be drawn from that and to the extent that there's maybe some more money going to uh, rural districts than otherwise would have been to what extent would that help to offset some of these additional costs we were just discussing well you would hope that it would help and uh, I think the bottom line is any funding formula is only good if it's funded and thus far there has been a commitment to at least put new money towards that formula Obviously, the faster we get school districts up to adequacy, which that was the, out, the goal, was to get every school district to at least 90% of that adequacy level, and the sooner we get every district to that adequacy level, the faster we reduce the inequities that we see in our neediest school districts. So in that respect, as long as you fund that formula, it will eventually close the gap. Uh, between the haves and the have-nots and it will eliminate some of the inequity of the previous funding formula and drive dollars to children who need it the most. But again, at the end of the day, a formula is only as good as the funding that goes into it. And so early indications are that the governor and the legislature are committed to continuing to put new revenue into that formula. So that will help with some of these challenges with new mandates. Um, but our position has always been that we would oppose mandates that aren't funded. Uh, I know for years the school, we were supposed to have a, what we say is a foundation level at right. the time. The, the number I remember, it was $6,019 per pupil. Uh, on the other hand, terminology, uh, it's misleading because we were paying under that. Right. Uh, do you know about where we are now? Uh, Governor Rauner's administration put some more money in K-12 education. Uh, are, we, we how, would, whereabouts are we at this time? We, we would still, the current trajectory that we're on, it could still take up to eight years to get every school district up to that adequacy target that's been established. 
Um, I think the difference this time around with this particular funding formula, a couple things. One, it was, it, it was designed to address the inequity issue. And, uh, you know, that was a key part of it. And that if you continue to fund it over time, eventually you would get every school district up to an adequacy level. And it started with the design of this new formula was with a prototypical school and what it should take in terms of funding to get a school district to that level. Previous funding formulas really was an arbitrary number that nobody really knew how they arrived at that number. It was kind of like, well, this is what we have available, so this is what we'll put into the funding formula. Where in this case, with the new formula, a lot of thought went into the elements of it and what those elements might cost and what it would take to get us there. So I think it's, it's much more detailed. It, it includes research-based elements uh, and an adequacy target calculated for every school district in the state to really get at that issue of equity for all students. You know, one thing uh, from covering the School Boards Association Conference uh, over the years that uh, impressed me, and I, I didn't know this in the beginning, I think a lot of people are still unaware, uh, that school board members, for all the work they do and the meetings and the homework and they don't get paid for being on a school board. I, I always find that to be one of the most remarkable uh, and civic virtues of our society. And, and these people really, really don't, they, they, they sometimes take an awful lot of guff from people. They do. Uh, when and yet they're doing this for nothing. You, you <laughs> tend not to hear from people when they're happy <laughs> right. when you're on a school board. And, and, you know, I give them such great credit because they truly are community servants. It's a calling. You have to believe in in education and believe in children and, and really be a supporter of public education and local school board governance. And uh, I think it's democracy that works um, where, you know, they're working on behalf of their community, their taxpayers, the children uh, who live there, and, and uh, it's great work. Yeah, sometimes I think we just don't appreciate the democracy. You know, we, we grow up with democracy and it seems like an esoteric idea. Uh, but as you said, when you have the annual conference, there's the board members and they're taking votes on what, it's not a top-down, it's a bottom-up uh, approach to these issues. Right. And they're bringing you all this information from their communities, whether it's, uh, you know, the Winnetka or whether it's Carbondale. Sure. I mean, so. And every election cycle, we expect about a 20% turnover of school board members statewide, so we gear up for training of new board members and that'll be taking place as soon as this election takes place in April. Uh, we have training already scheduled for the new board members to immediately get uh, oriented and some initial training uh, in what they need to do and what their role is as a school board member. So that's just part of what we do. And that's, that's something I wanted to touch on just to open that up a little bit uh, because that's also remarkable. So we have eight what, 850-something school districts, right. uh, each of them has a school board. Uh, is there a set number of, who sets how many school board members? Is it set by the district? Uh, generally, it's seven. And uh, as I said, in any particular election cycle, you'll see 20% turnover. So if you, uh, we have nearly 6,000 members of our association, so we can do the math. but. It's a substantial turnover, about 20% every two years. And, uh, and that's a challenge to train them. But the other thing is, even for those who have been on the board for a while, uh, in fact, Representative Darren Bailey is a freshman House member, uh, but we interviewed him recently, and he was saying that he was his school board president of the, the, uh, for about the last 12 years or so. So he brings that. Sure. But when, when you have these changes or proposed changes in the law, even for those who have experience on the board, there's something new for them to have to keep up. Sure. There's a big learning curve for new school board members about what you're legally required to do as a school district. A lot of times new school board members will get on a board and they'll start asking questions about why you do things. And uh, they sometimes learn that it's a legal requirement, it's a mandate. and uh, yeah, learning. Our, our role is to help close that learning curve so that they can be effective as quickly as possible and be a, a part of a governance team. I don't know if you, uh, if, if there's a, a, a parent out there and they have kids 
maybe they have some issue they you know that somebody's doing something at the school they they want to take issue with. What would you recommend for those parents to say? How how should they approach? school boards what's the best way to have that line of communication well normally what we would tell them is if you do have an issue that's specific to a building or a teacher in a building where your child attends try to resolve it at that level first but in the end if you can't get resolution there is a public comment period at every school board meeting that's one of the valuable parts of the school board meeting is that there is a time for public input at every board meeting there's always an opportunity. We encourage the public to attend, to be active, to be involved with their schools, and to take an interest in what their school boards do and to support the work of their school boards. So best advice is if you have a particular pro a specific problem, try to work it out at the level in which it's occurring, and the, but to also to be involved with your schools and to consider running for the school board. You know, sometimes school boards will have an idea that they go, hey, uh, th this will help our district, and that's a proactive approach. So many times, and this is true in all of our lives, we have something happen outside that we have to react to. Obviously, one of the things that's changed since you and I were growing up, and I don't know what accounts for this, but we see it across America, this level of violence that sometimes is going. Um, so school safety over the last, I don't know, 10 years or 15 years has increasingly become one of the things that is discussed. Um, it, are there any particular trends in there? And to what extent, in, in, on, on a topic like that, do you have the local school districts trying to say, what can we do to make our school safer? Or is that where it's more of a collective approach that maybe as a, an association, and I really don't know the answer to this, do you say, hey, we have an expert here, or we have this expert, and we can help you gather the information you need to consider? Well, actually, you'll get both. But um, in terms of school security, I'll address that first. But certainly in my 34 years in education, we've seen a dramatic change, not only in the need to physically secure our physical plants, with secure entrances and emergency protocols and all of that, but the social emotional needs and mental health needs of our students. There's been a dramatic change there. And so districts looking for more services, more training for their staff, and how to work with children who, um, who've experienced trauma in their lives. And so we, I made the comment last week at a board of directors meeting of our association that at our annual conference we cannot offer enough sessions on security and social emotional issues and mental health issues. We have a pre-conference session on school security that is sold out every year. We have uh, lots of sessions at the conference about dealing with trauma and uh, trauma-informed practices in your schools and mental health services and working with community agencies. So the need is just continuing to grow across our country and it permeates itself in our schools and so um, we will also have districts that might uh, propose positions that they want our association to take uh, whether it's just a belief statement last year related to emotional mental health services more support for school resource officers that we might then take a position on legislatively to try to build support for. You know, one of the things that I think sometimes there's a disconnect between the public and those who are teachers or administrators. I grew up in the 1960s, and so we think back of our experience, and we extrapolate that it's more or less the same thing going on today. And I think we as a society sometimes forget that, I mean, just how dramatically different the experience of being in a school today is from the 1960s. We didn't have this violence. We didn't have, if you look at society at large, we see this opioid crisis just ending up the influx of illegal immigrants, and that has an impact on different schools. There's a, it's just a different society, in some ways better, in some ways worse. We obviously didn't have the internet when we were growing up. But uh, is that something that you see when you're trying to communicate or when sometimes people are criticizing uh, education that 
there's a knowledge gap or maybe just a lack of appreciation of what are the actualities of happening inside education today that wasn't the case sure. 40 or 50 years ago? Sure, and you'll hear the, the analogy sometimes of every child comes to school with an invisible backpack, and in that invisible backpack are all of the things that they are bringing with them, whether it's trauma at home or a parent that's incarcerated or a mental health issue or living in poverty, and so the challenges are so much greater for some of our children and our families today than they were 30 to 40 years ago. And schools are being asked to do so much more for their children and for their families, where you truly are the hub of the community serving breakfast, serving lunch, serving after school snacks, dinner, helping with homework, bringing in medical services and dental services into your schools to support, mental health services into your schools to support the children. So schools have become so much more than just an institution of education and our children are coming to us with so many more issues than they were 30 to 40 years ago and our families don't look the same that they did 30 to 40 years ago either and so just so many more challenges and as I say public schools we take every child that comes to us regardless of the issues they come to us with and that's one of the great things about public education is we take them all and we do the very best we can with every child that walks through that door and every family that walks through that door. Um, before we close out, uh, for a number of years there that we didn't pass a budget, although the schools typically were funded, but you, the schools weren't getting paid uh, some of the, the grants, uh, the compensation for transportation, as an example which is particularly costly for, again, some of the poorest districts because they're in rural areas. Right. Their school buses have to travel much more distances and that can actually run into millions of dollars over the course of a year. People don't stop to think, I think, how much money that is. Where, where are the districts as far as getting money from the state that, that is owed to them from previous school years? I think they're in a better position than they have been for the last four or five years, perhaps even eight years. But I think many districts are digging out of a hole. And so we're in year two of, of doing that digging. Um, but the reality is you're st we're still at least one transportation payment behind and we have been for a decade now. And uh, I think schools are grateful right now that they're being funded uh, with the new formula that the categorical programs like transportation are being funded. Um, so that certainly helps. Um, you alluded to the transportation cost of, of rural districts in particular. And you know, one of the challenges, it's easy for someone who doesn't understand to say, well, we need to put more schools together so that we consolidate our costs. But when you're talking about in some areas of our state, there's only one school district in a county. Right. And so to try to merge them with another school district with massive bus routes and children on school buses for a long period of time, it's just not as easy as it appears to be. And you're just adding to the transportation cost when you bring together districts that are already geographically spread out. I, I, I heard someone speak, uh, one of the board members, not too long ago, and they were saying that they have sometimes, there's some kids, and they were from southern Illinois, are on the school bus an hour and a half. Uh, I mean, I think a lot it's of times people of. from the suburban, suburban areas or Chicago, they don't even conceive of that. Uh, they don't realize it, and you have to point it out. Is, it, has there been any thought, or is there maybe already a program, to say to the state to where the state may not have the monies to do across the board uh, with all the thousands of school uh, children there are, but. Uh, to say to some of these districts that have that exceptional transportation cost and conversely are some of the poorest districts to say let's have a just a funding for those districts you know where the funding is already low and yet they have an exceptionally high can can we increase the grants has any effort been made on, on that Category. Not that I'm not that I'm aware of the previous you know the transportation formula does factor in miles traveled, <laughs> okay. but 
you know, in special education, we used to have what's called extraordinary costs, which are if you have these exceptional costs, that you might be able to get some additional reimbursement. So something like that could certainly be considered for, for transportation, that if you're a school district that just has extraordinary costs because of your geographical spread of your school district, that you might be able to do something else and, and to help support that. And at least that, that wouldn't be uh, the... The state wouldn't have to, again, it, when you're not going across the board, it wouldn't necessarily right. be uh, cost prohibitive, but it would help out those particularly. Some school districts, I'll point out for the viewers, I mean, there are some, and I've been told on some of the richer districts on the north side of Chicago, have such a cash reserve, they could go the entire school year uh, without having to have any state money. They may have $80 million or more in reserve. Uh, and I think other districts where they used to have a cash reserve have now depleted much of it because of the last several years and the problems in funding. Is that I think the challenge with any change to any formula, whether it's the state aid formula, transportation, if it creates winners and losers, then the political battle lines get drawn. And we saw that play out for so many years until finally there was... Uh, th there was an ability to coalesce around a new formula that didn't create winners and losers, uh, that nobody lost funding, and that's how they got the political capital to pass it, was that there weren't losers. So that's the challenge, is when what you propose produces losers, then politically the lines get drawn. One last thing I'll, I'll, before we close out, that uh, everyone knows the property taxes are high in the state and across the board people complain about that. Sometimes there is a, a recommendation to say let's have a property tax freeze, which while that might be desirable to the homeowners, I'm a homeowner, it would be nice to sure. have that, but again not thinking through sometimes the issues. What impact would a property tax freeze if it were proposed of three years let's say have on school districts? I think it would in some cases could have a catastrophic effect unless a corresponding increase in state funding offset the loss of that revenue. And I know in my prior work as a school superintendent, I actually had done an analysis of the proposed property tax freeze at that time, coupled with the proposed new state formula, and it was essentially a wash that in our case, the amount of state money coming in would be offset by the property tax freeze on the local side, so there would be no net gain. I think the bottom line is it would depend upon how property tax reliant that school district is. There's a huge variance in our state for how much revenue comes from local property taxes to a district versus state aid. The more property wealthy a district is, the less state aid they have gotten historically. And so a freeze impacts property wealthy districts a lot more than property poor districts because they're more state aid dependent. So there's just a huge variance in the impact of that. And I think people sometimes think that the, the people in the suburban areas pay the highest property taxes. On, on one hand, they probably do as far as dollars. Uh, but on the assessed valuation of property, I think the highest school district in the state is East St. Louis. And precisely because sure. their property values are so low, they, to they have the to have a rate. much higher assessed right. valuation right. just to generate any income. Right, they have to raise their tax rate until they can produce the amount of money they need, and that means their tax rate goes really high. And uh, that's just, you know, a challenge of it. And, and I used to make the case as a superintendent that property, tax, property owners are reliable. They generally pay their tax bill. Right. And they believe it's too high, but they still pay their tax bill. And do you trust that that freeze would be offset by an increase in state funding? So I think there's the challenge locally is, do you trust that if there was a freeze, you would get an offsetting amount of money from the state to offset that amount that you saved the local property tax owners? And historically, we lived a dec nearly a decade with proration of general state aid. So you what couldn't... What does proration mean? A reduction in general state aid. So you couldn't trust that the state would make up for any property tax freeze that takes place. Nobody's arguing that our property uh, tax system in our state is antiquated. 
There's no doubt about it. Uh, it's just a matter of how you get beyond that system. We don't have time to go through. I could probably talk yeah. for two hours or we won't. Uh, but one last thing that just that came when we were talking about the property taxes that occurred to me, and I don't, I don't think this is going anywhere this year, but a few years back, and it may come back again, uh, Speaker Madigan proposed to, he, he gave a, a talk about uh, 2015, I think it was, and he said, you know, about 56% of the pension problem is teachers, and they're not even state workers. So he was saying we ought to send these pension bills back to the school districts. What impact would that have in your estimation if that were approached to happen? Well, if the pension cost shift was shifted to the local school districts, it would definitely have an impact on local property taxes because how else would a school district be able to make that pension obligation payment? I, I just don't know how else they could do that without cutting services and programs for children or a corresponding increase in local property taxes. So that's always been the push back on a tax shift or a pension shift is that it's essentially a tax shift. It's shifting from state to local property taxes. I mean, just speaking from my own assessment, uh, while the state might all of a sudden have a much better balance, uh, financial uh, uh, profit and loss statement, so to speak, uh, it would, I think, be catastrophic for both the school districts as well as the taxpayers because the same taxpayers are going to have to be paid. Right. It, it just depends what pocket their pension money is going out of. And uh, depending upon, again, some of these smaller districts in these agriculture areas, I don't know how that would even fly. And I know. think ultimately how big of an impact something like that would have would depend upon how quickly it was shifted and how much. I mean, those are all variables that would impact how much of an impact it would have on a school district and the taxpayers. Dr. Tom Birch, and we probably kept you longer than no, we should have, fine. but we appreciate Glad your time. Do. Sure. All right. Thanks so Thanks. much. Thanks. Our officers, Jeff Parkwoods, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Channel. We're going to take a bit of an in-depth look at the uh, run for the mayor of Chicago. I think what they care about is the issues we're talking about. What are you going to do about the schools? What are you going to do about fixing the uh, financial situation of the city? And what are you going to do about the level of crime and ensuring that we have safe neighborhoods? Would I be right on that? <laughs> yes. The Illinois Channel, keeping you connected to your state, your issues your home.